This is a text-to-speech narration of Leon Trotsky's text, The Lessons of October. Any pronunciation errors are due to the limitations of this technology. Chapter 1. We must study the October Revolution. We met with success in the October Revolution, but the October Revolution has met with little success in our press. Up to the present time we lack a single work, which gives a comprehensive picture of the October upheaval and puts the proper stress upon its most important political and organizational aspects. One worse yet, even the available first-hand material including the most important documents directly pertaining to the various particulars of the preparation for the revolution, or the revolution itself remains unpublished as yet. Numerous documents and considerable material have been issued bearing on the pre-October history of the revolution and the pre-October history of the party. We have also issued much material and many documents relating to the post-October period. But October itself has received far less attention. Having achieved the revolution, we seem to have concluded that we should never have to repeat it. It is as if we thought that no immediate and direct benefit for the unpostponable tasks of future constructive work could be derived from the study of October, the actual conditions of the direct preparation for it, the actual accomplishment of it, and the work of consolidating it during the first few weeks. Such an approach, though it may be subconscious, is, however, profoundly erroneous, and is, moreover, narrow and nationalistic. We ourselves may never have to repeat the experience of the October Revolution, but this does not at all imply that we have nothing to learn from that experience. We are a part of the international too, and the workers in all other countries are still faced with a solution of the problem of their own October. Last year we had ample proof that the most advanced communist parties of the West had not only failed to assimilate our October experience, but were virtually ignorant of the actual facts. To be sure, the objection may be raised that it is impossible to study October or even to publish documents relating to October without the risk of stirring up old disagreements. But such an approach to the question would be altogether petty. The disagreements of 1917 were indeed very profound, and they were not by any means accidental. But nothing could be more paltry than an attempt to turn them now after a lapse of several years, into weapons of attack against those who were at that time mistaken. It would be, however, even more inadmissible to remain silent as regards the most important problems of the October Revolution, which are of international significance on account of trifling personal considerations. Last year we met with two crushing defeats in Bulgaria. First, the party let slip an exceptionally favorable moment for revolutionary action on account of fatalistic and doctrinaire considerations. That moment was the rising of the peasants after the June coup of Tsongkhov. Then the party, striving to make good its mistake, plunged into the September insurrection without having made the necessary political or organizational preparations. The Bulgarian Revolution ought to have been a prelude to the German Revolution. Unfortunately, the bad Bulgarian prelude led to an even worse sequel in Germany itself. In the latter part of last year, we witnessed in Germany a classic demonstration of how it is possible to miss a perfectly exceptional revolutionary situation of world historic importance. Once more, however, neither the Bulgarian nor even the German experiences of last year have received an adequate or sufficiently concrete appraisal. The author of these lines drew a general outline of the development of events in Germany last year. Everything that transpired since then has borne out this outline in part and as a whole. No one else has even attempted to advance any other explanation. But we need more than an outline. It is indispensable for us to have a concrete account, full of factual data, of last year's developments in Germany. What we need is such an account as would provide a concrete explanation of the causes of this most cruel historic defeat. It is difficult, however, to speak of an analysis of the events in Bulgaria and Germany when we have not, up to the present, given a politically and tactically elaborated account of the October Revolution. We have never made clear to ourselves what we accomplished and how we accomplished it. After October in the flush of victory, it seemed as if the events of Europe would develop of their own accord and moreover within so brief a period as would leave no time for any theoretical assimilation of the lessons of October. But the events have proved that without a party capable of directing the proletarian revolution, 
the revolution itself is rendered impossible. The proletariat cannot seize power by a spontaneous uprising. Even in highly industrialized and highly cultured Germany, the spontaneous uprising of the toilers in November 1918 only succeeded in transferring power to the hands of the bourgeoisie. One propertied class is able to seize the power that has been wrested from another propertied class because it is able to base itself upon its riches, its cultural level, and its innumerable connections with the old state apparatus. But there is nothing else that can serve the proletariat as a substitute for its own party. It was only by the middle of 1921 that the fully rounded out work of building the communist parties really began under the slogan, Win the Masses, United Front, etc. The problems of October receded and, simultaneously, the study of October was also relegated to the background. Last year we found ourselves once again face to face with the problems of the proletarian revolution. It is high time we collected all documents, printed all available material, and applied ourselves to their study. We are well aware, of course, that every nation, every class, and even every party learns primarily from the harsh blows of its own experience. But that does not in the least imply that the experience of other countries and classes and parties is of minor importance. Had we failed to study the Great French Revolution, the Revolution of 1848, and the Paris Commune, we should never have been able to achieve the October Revolution, even though we passed through the experience of the year 1905. And after all, we went through this national experience of ours basing ourselves on deductions from previous revolutions and extending their historical line. Afterwards, the entire period of the counter-revolution was taken up with the study of the lessons to be learned and the deductions to be drawn from the year 1905. Yet no such work has been done with regard to the victorious revolution of 1917, no, not even a tenth part of it. Of course, we are not now living through the years of reaction, nor are we in exile. On the other hand, the forces and resources at our command now are in no way comparable to what we had during those years of hardship. All that we need do is to pose clearly and plainly the task of studying the October Revolution, both on the party scale and on the scale of the international as a whole. It is indispensable for the entire party, and especially its younger generations, to study and assimilate step by step the experience of October which provided the supreme, incontestable, and irrevocable test of the past and opened wide the gates to the future. The German lesson of last year is not only a serious reminder, but also a dire warning. An objection will no doubt be raised that even the most thorough knowledge of the course of the October Revolution would by no means have guaranteed victory to our German party. But this kind of wholesale and essentially Philistine rationalizing will get us nowhere. To be sure, mere study of the October Revolution is not sufficient to secure victory in other countries, but circumstances may arise where all the prerequisites for revolution exist, with the exception of a far-seeing and resolute party leadership grounded in the understanding of the laws and methods of the revolution. This was exactly the situation last year in Germany. Similar situations may recur in other countries. But for the study of the laws and methods of proletarian revolution, there is, up to the present time, no more important and profound a source than our October experience. Leaders of European communist parties who fail to assimilate the history of October by means of a critical and closely detailed study would resemble a commander-in-chief preparing new wars under modern conditions, who fails to study the strategic, tactical, and technical experience of the last imperialist war. Such a commander-in-chief would inevitably doom his armies to defeat in the future. The fundamental instrument of proletarian revolution is the party. On the basis of our experience even taking only one year, from February 1917 to February 1918, and on the basis of the supplementary experience in Finland, Hungary, Italy, Bulgaria, and Germany, we can posit as almost an unalterable law that a party crisis is inevitable in the transition from preparatory revolutionary activity to the immediate struggle for power. Generally speaking, crises arise in the party at every serious turn in the party's course, either as a prelude to the turn or as a consequence of it. The explanation for this lies in the fact that every period in the development of the party has special features of its own and calls for specific habits and methods of work. 
A tactical turn implies a greater or lesser break in these habits and methods. Herein lies the direct and most immediate root of internal party frictions and crises. Too often has it happened, wrote Lenin in July 1917, that when history has taken a sharp turn, even progressive parties have for some time been unable to adapt themselves to the new situation and have repeated slogans which had formerly been correct, but had now lost all meaning lost it as suddenly as the sharp turn in history was sudden. C.W. Moscow 1964, Vol. 25, on slogans mid-July 1917, P. 183. Hence the danger arises that if the turn is too abrupt or too sudden, and if in the preceding period too many elements of inertia and conservatism have accumulated in the leading organs of the party, then the party will prove itself unable to fulfill its leadership at that supreme and critical moment for which it has been preparing itself in the course of years or decades. The party is ravaged by a crisis, and the movement passes the party by and heads toward defeat. A revolutionary party is subjected to the pressure of other political forces. At every given stage of its development, the party elaborates its own methods of counteracting and resisting this pressure. During a tactical turn and the resulting internal regroupments and frictions, the party's power of resistance becomes weakened. From this, the possibility always arises that the internal groupings in the party, which originate from the necessity of a turn in tactics, may develop far beyond the original controversial points of departure and serve as a support for various class tendencies. To put the case more plainly, the party that does not keep step with the historical tasks of its own class becomes, or runs the risk of becoming, the indirect tool of other classes. If what we said above is true of every serious turn in tactics, it is all the more true of great turns in strategy. By tactics and politics we understand, using the analogy of military science, the art of conducting isolated operations. By strategy, we understand the art of conquest, i.e. the seizure of power. Prior to the war, we did not, as a rule, make this distinction. In the epoch of the Second International, we confined ourselves solely to the conception of social democratic tactics. Nor was this accidental. The social democracy applied parliamentary tactics, trade union tactics, municipal tactics, cooperative tactics, and so on. But the question of combining all forces and resources, all sorts of troops to obtain victory over the enemy, was really never raised in the epoch of the Second International insofar as the practical task of the struggle for power was not raised. It was only the 1905 revolution that first posed, after a long interval, the fundamental or strategical questions of proletarian struggle. By reason of this, it secured immense advantages to the revolutionary Russian Social Democrats, i.e. the Bolsheviks. The great epoch of revolutionary strategy began in 1917, first for Russia and afterwards for the rest of Europe. Strategy, of course, does not do away with tactics. The questions of the trade union movement, of parliamentary activity, and so on, do not disappear, but they now become invested with a new meaning as subordinate methods of a combined struggle for power. Tactics are subordinated to strategy. If tactical turns usually lead to internal friction in the party, how much deeper and fiercer must be the friction resulting from strategical turns? And the most abrupt of all turns is the turn of the proletarian party from the work of preparation and propaganda, or organization and agitation, to the immediate struggle for power, to an armed insurrection against the bourgeoisie. Whatever remains in the party that is irresolute, skeptical, conciliationist, capitulatory in short, Menshevik all this rises to the surface in opposition to the insurrection, seeks theoretical formulas to justify its opposition and finds them ready-made in the arsenal of the opportunist opponents of yesterday. We shall have occasion to observe this phenomenon more than once in the future. The final review and selection of party weapons on the eve of the decisive struggle took place during the interval from February to October 1917 on the basis of the widest possible agitational and organizational work among the masses. During and after October these weapons were tested in the fire of colossal historic actions. To undertake at the present time, several years after October, an appraisal of the different viewpoints concerning revolution in general, and the Russian Revolution in particular,
and in so doing to evade the experience of 1917, is to busy oneself with barren scholasticism. That would certainly not be a Marxist political analysis. It would be analogous to wrangling over the advantages of various systems of swimming, while we stubbornly refused to turn our eyes to the river where swimmers were putting these systems into practice. No better test of viewpoints concerning revolution exists than the verification of how they worked out during the revolution itself, just as a system of swimming is best tested when a swimmer jumps into the water. Chapter 2. The Democratic Dictatorship of the Proletariat and Peasantry In February and October, the course and the outcome of the October Revolution dealt a relentless blow to the scholastic parody of Marxism, which was very widespread among the Russian Social Democrats, beginning in part with the emancipation of Labor Group 1 and finding its most finished expression among the Mensheviks. The essence of this pseudo-Marxism consisted in perverting Marx's conditional and limited conception that the country that is more developed industrially only shows, to the less developed, the image of its own future into an absolute and to use Marx's own expression superhistorical law, and then in seeking to establish upon the basis of that law the tactics of the proletarian party. Such a formulation naturally excluded even the mention of any struggle on the part of the Russian proletariat for the seizure of power until the more highly developed countries had set up precedent. There is, of course, no disputing that every backward country finds some traits of its own future in the history of advanced countries, but there cannot be any talk of a repetition of the development as a whole. On the contrary, the more capitalist economy acquired a world character, all the more strikingly original became the development of the backward countries, which had to necessarily combine elements of their backwardness with the latest achievements of capitalist development. In his preface to the peasant war in Germany, Engels wrote, At a certain point, which must not necessarily appear simultaneously and on the same stage of development everywhere, the bourgeoisie begins to note that this, its second self the proletariat has outgrown it. Moscow, 1965, P13. The course of historical development constrained the Russian bourgeoisie to make this observation much earlier and more completely than the bourgeoisie of all other countries. Lenin, even prior to 1905, gave expression to the peculiar character of the Russian Revolution in the formula, the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. This formula, in itself, as future development showed, could acquire meaning only as a stage toward the socialist dictatorship of the proletariat supported by the peasantry. Lenin's formulation of the problem, revolutionary and dynamic through and through, was completely and irreconcilably counterpoised to the Menshevik pattern, according to which Russia could pretend only to a repetition of the history of the advanced nations, with the bourgeoisie in power and the social democrats in opposition. Some circles of our party, however, laid the stress not upon the dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry in Lenin's formula, but upon its democratic character as opposed to its socialist character. And again, this could only mean that in Russia, a backward country, only a democratic revolution was conceivable. The socialist revolution was to begin in the West, and we could take to the road of socialism only in the wake of England, France, and Germany. But such a formulation of the question slipped inevitably into Menshevism, and this was fully revealed in 1917 when the tasks of the revolution were posed before us, not for prognosis, but for decisive action. Under the actual conditions of revolution, to hold a position of supporting democracy, pushed to its logical conclusion opposing socialism as being premature meant in politics to shift from a proletarian to a petty bourgeois position. It meant going over to the position of the left wing of national revolution. The February Revolution, if considered by itself, was a bourgeois revolution. But as a bourgeois revolution, it came too late and was devoid of any stability, torn asunder by contradictions which immediately found their expression in dual power. It had to either change into a direct prelude to the proletarian revolution, which is what usually did happen or throw Russia back into a semicolonial existence under some sort of bourgeois oligarchic regime. Consequently, the period following the February Revolution could be regarded from two points of view, either as a period of consolidating, developing, or consummating the democratic revolution, or as a period of preparation for the proletarian revolution. 
The first point of view was held not only by the Mensheviks and the Social Revolutionaries SRS, but also by a certain section of our own party leadership, with this difference. That the latter really tried to push democratic revolution as far as possible to the left. But the method was essentially one and the same to exert pressure on the ruling bourgeoisie, a pressure so calculated as to remain within the framework of the bourgeois democratic regime. If that policy had prevailed, the development of the revolution would have passed over the head of our party, and in the end, the insurrection of the worker and peasant masses would have taken place without party leadership. In other words, we would have had a repetition of the July Days too on a colossal scale, i.e. this time not as an episode, but as a catastrophe. It is perfectly obvious that the immediate consequence of such a catastrophe would have been the physical destruction of our party. This provides us with a measuring stick of how deep our differences of opinion were. The influence of the Mensheviks and the SRS in the first period of the revolution was not, of course, accidental. It reflected the preponderance of petty bourgeois masses mainly peasants in the population, and the immaturity of the revolution itself. It was precisely that immaturity, amidst the extremely exceptional circumstances arising from the war, which placed in the hands of the petty bourgeois revolutionists the leadership, or at least the semblance of leadership, which came to this, that they defended the historical rights of the bourgeoisie to power. But this does not in the least mean that the Russian Revolution could have taken no course other than the one it did from February to October 1917. The latter course flowed not only from the relations between the classes, but also from the temporary circumstances created by the war. Because of the war, the peasantry was organized and armed in an army of many millions. Before the proletariat succeeded in organizing itself under its own banner and taking the leadership of the rural masses, the petty bourgeois revolutionists found a natural support in the peasant army, which was rebelling against the war. By the ponderous weight of this multi-millioned army upon which, after all, everything directly depended, the petty bourgeois revolutionists brought pressure to bear on the workers and carried them along in the first period. That the revolution might have taken a different course on the same class foundations is best of all demonstrated by the events immediately preceding the war. In July 1914 Petrograd was convulsed by revolutionary strikes. Matters had gone so far as open fighting in the streets. The absolute leadership of that movement was in the hands of the underground organization and the legal press of our party. Bolshevism was increasing its influence in a direct struggle against liquidationism and the petty bourgeois parties generally. The further growth of the movement would have meant above all the growth of the Bolshevik party. The Soviets of workers' deputies in 1914, if developments had reached the stage of Soviets, would probably have been Bolshevik from the outset. The awakening of the villages would have proceeded under the direct or indirect leadership of the city Soviets, led by the Bolsheviks. This does not necessarily mean that the SRS would have immediately disappeared from the villages. No, in all probability, the first stage of the peasant revolution would have occurred under the banner of the Narodniks populists. But with the development of events such as we have sketched, the Narodniks themselves would have been compelled to push their left wing to the fore in order to seek an alliance with the Bolshevik Soviets in the cities. Of course, the immediate outcome of the insurrection would have depended, even in such a case, in the first instance upon the mood and conduct of the army, which was bound up with the peasantry. It is impossible, and even superfluous to guess now whether the movement of 1914-15 would have led to victory had not the outbreak of the war forged a new and gigantic link in the chain of developments. Considerable evidence, however, may be adduced that had the victorious revolution unfolded along the course which began with the events in July 1914, the overthrow of the Tsarist monarchy would, in all likelihood, have meant the immediate assumption of power by the revolutionary workers' Soviets, and the latter, through the medium of the left Narodniks, would from the very outset have drawn the peasant masses within their orbit. The war interrupted the unfolding revolutionary movement. It acted at first to retard, but afterwards to accelerate it enormously. Through the medium of the multimillioned army, the war created an absolutely exceptional base, both socially and organizationally, for the petty bourgeois parties. For the peculiarity of the peasantry consists precisely in the fact that despite their great numbers, 
it is difficult to form the peasants into an organized base, even when they are imbued with a revolutionary spirit, hoisting themselves on the shoulders of a ready-made organization. That is, the army, the petty bourgeois parties overawed the proletariat and befogged it with defensism. 3. That is why Lenin at once came out furiously against the old slogan of the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry, which under the new circumstances meant the transformation of the Bolshevik party into the left wing of the defensist bloc. For Lenin the main task was to lead the proletarian vanguard from the swamp of defensism out into the clear. Only on that condition could the proletariat at the next stage become the axis around which the toiling masses of the village would group themselves. But in that case, what should our attitude be toward the democratic revolution, or rather toward the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry? Lenin was ruthless in refuting the old Bolsheviks who, more than once already have played so regrettable a role in the history of our party by reiterating formulas senselessly learned by rote instead of studying the specific features of the new and living reality. But one must measure up not to old formulas, but to the new reality. Is this reality covered by Comrade Kamenev's old Bolshevik formula, which says that the bourgeois democratic revolution is not completed? It is not, Lenin answers. The formula is obsolete. It is no good at all. It is dead. And it is no use trying to revive it. C.W. Moscow, 1964, Vol. 24. Letters on Tactics, April 8, 13, 1917, pp. 4450. To be sure, Lenin occasionally remarked that the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies in the first period of the February Revolution did, to a certain degree, embody the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. And this was true insofar as these Soviets embodied power in general. But as Lenin time and again explained, the Soviets of the February period embodied only demi-power. They supported the power of the bourgeoisie while exercising semi-oppositionist pressure upon it. And it was precisely this intermediate position that did not permit them to transcend the framework of the democratic coalition of workers, peasants, and soldiers. In its form of rule, this coalition tended toward dictatorship to the extent that it did not rely upon regulated governmental relations, but upon armed force and direct revolutionary supervision. However, it fell far short of an actual dictatorship. The instability of the conciliationist Soviets lay precisely in this democratic amorphousness of a demi-power coalition of workers, peasants, and soldiers. The Soviets had to either disappear entirely or take real power into their hands. But they could take power not in the capacity of a democratic coalition of workers and peasants represented by different parties, but only as the dictatorship of the proletariat directed by a single party and drawing after it the peasant masses beginning with their semi-proletarian sections. In other words, a democratic workers' and peasants' coalition could only take shape as an immature form of power incapable of attaining real power. It could take shape only as a tendency and not as a concrete fact. Any further movement toward the attainment of power inevitably had to explode the democratic shell, confront the majority of the peasantry with the necessity of following the workers, provide the proletariat with an opportunity to realize a class dictatorship, and thereby place on the agenda along with a complete and ruthlessly radical democratization of social relations, a purely socialist invasion of the workers' state into the sphere of capitalist property rights. Under such circumstances, whoever continued to cling to the formula of a democratic dictatorship in effect renounced power and led the revolution into a blind alley. The fundamental controversial question around which everything else centered was this, whether or not we should struggle for power, whether or not we should assume power. This alone is ample proof that we were not then dealing with a mere episodic difference of opinion but with two tendencies of the utmost principled significance. The first and principal tendency was proletarian and led to the road of world revolution. The other was democratic, i.e. petty bourgeois, and led, in the last analysis, to the subordination of proletarian policies to the requirements of bourgeois society in the process of reform. These two tendencies came into hostile conflict over every essential question that arose throughout the year 1917. 
It is precisely the revolutionary epoch, i.e. the epoch when the accumulated capital of the party is put in direct circulation that must inevitably broach in action and reveal divergences of such a nature. These two tendencies, in greater or lesser degree, with more or less modification, will more than once manifest themselves during the revolutionary period in every country. If by Bolshevism, and we are stressing here its essential aspect, we understand such training, tempering, and organization of the proletarian vanguard as enables the latter to seize power, arms in hand. And if by social democracy we are to understand the acceptance of reformist oppositional activity within the framework of bourgeois society and an adaptation to its legality, I e. the actual training of the masses to become imbued with the inviolability of the bourgeois state. Then, indeed, it is absolutely clear that even within the Communist Party itself, which does not emerge full-fledged from the crucible of history, the struggle between social democratic tendencies and Bolshevism is bound to reveal itself in its most clear, open, and uncamouflaged form during the immediate revolutionary period when the question of power is posed point-blank. The problem of the conquest of power was put before the party only after April 4, that is, after the arrival of Lenin in Petrograd. But even after that moment, the political line of the party did not by any means acquire a unified and indivisible character, challenged by none. Despite the decisions of the April Conference in 1917, the opposition to the revolutionary course sometimes hidden, sometimes open pervaded the entire period of preparation. The study of the trend of the disagreements between February and the consolidation of the October Revolution is not only of extraordinary theoretical importance, but of the utmost practical importance. In 1910, Lenin spoke of the disagreements at the Second Party Congress in 93 as anticipatory, i.e. a forewarning. It is very important to trace these disagreements to their source, i.e. 93, or even at an earlier time, say beginning with economism, for, but such a study acquires meaning only if it came to its logical conclusion, and if it covers the period in which these disagreements were submitted to the decisive test, that is to say, the October period. We cannot, within the limits of this preface, undertake to deal exhaustively with all the stages of this struggle. But we consider it indispensable at least partially to fill up the deplorable gap in our literature, with regard to the most important period in the development of our party. As has already been said, the disagreement centered around the question of power. Generally speaking, this is the touchstone whereby the character of the revolutionary party and of other parties as well is determined. There is an intimate connection between the question of power and the question of war, which was posed and decided in this period we propose to consider these questions in chronological order, taking the outstanding landmarks, the position of the party and of the party press in the first period after the overthrow of Tsarism and prior to the arrival of Lenin, the struggle around Lenin's The Seas, the April Conference, the aftermath of the July Days, the Kornilov period, the Democratic Conference and the Pre-Parliament, the question of the armed insurrection and seizure of power September to October, and the question of a homogeneous socialist government. The study of these disagreements will, we believe, enable us to draw deductions of considerable importance to other parties in the Communist International. Chapter 3. The Struggle Against War and Defensism The overthrow of Tsarism in February 1917 signaled, of course, a gigantic leap forward. But if we take February within the limits of February alone, i.e., if we take it not as a step towards October, then it meant no more than this. That Russia was approximating a bourgeois republic like, for example, France. The petty bourgeois revolutionary parties, as is their wont, considered the February Revolution to be neither bourgeois nor a step toward a socialist revolution, but as some sort of self-sufficing democratic entity. And upon this they constructed the ideology of revolutionary defensism. They were defending, if you please, not the rule of any one class, but revolution and democracy. But even in our own party, the revolutionary impetus of February engendered at first an extreme confusion of political perspectives. As a matter of fact, during the March days, Pravda held a position much closer to revolutionary defensism than to the position of Lenin. When one army stands opposed to another army, we read in one of its editorial articles, 
No policy could be more absurd than the policy of proposing that one of them should lay down arms and go home. Such a policy would not be a policy of peace, but a policy of enslavement, a policy to be scornfully rejected by a free people. No, the people will remain intrepidly at their post, answering bullet with bullet and shell with shell. This is beyond dispute. We must not allow any disorganization of the armed forces of the revolution. Pravda, No. 9, March 15, 1917, in the article No Secret Diplomacy. We find here no mention of classes, of the oppressors and the oppressed. There is, instead, talk of a free people. There are no classes struggling for power, but instead, a free people are remaining at their post. The ideas as well as the formulas are defensist through and through, and further in the same article. Our slogan is not the empty cry, down with war, which means the disorganization of the revolutionary army and of the army that is becoming ever more revolutionary. Our slogan is bring pressure, to bear on the provisional government so as to compel it to make, without fail, openly, and before the eyes of world democracy, an attempt to induce all the warring countries to initiate immediate negotiations to end the world war. Till then let everyone remain at his post. The program of exerting pressure on an imperialist government so as to induce it to pursue a pious course was the program of Kotsky and Ledeber in Germany, Jean Lant in France, MacDonald in England, but it was never the program of Bolshevism. In conclusion, the article not only extends the warmest greetings to the notorious manifesto of the Petrograd Soviet addressed to the peoples of the world, a manifesto permeated from beginning to end with the spirit of revolutionary defensism, but underscores, with pleasure, the solidarity of the editorial board with the openly defensist resolutions adopted at two meetings in Petrograd. Of these resolutions, it is enough to say that one runs as follows. If the democratic forces in Germany and Austria pay no heed to our voice, i.e., the voice of the provisional government and of the conciliationist Soviet, then we shall defend our fatherland to the last drop of our blood. Pravda, No. 9, March 15, 1917. The above quoted article is not an exception. On the contrary, it quite accurately expresses the position of Pravda prior to Lenin's return to Russia. Thus, in the next issue of the paper, in an article on the war, although it contains some criticism of the manifesto to the peoples of the world, the following occurs. It is impossible not to hail yesterday's proclamation of the Petrograd Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies to the peoples of the world, summoning them to force their governments to bring the slaughter to an end. Pravda, No. 10, March 16, 1917. And where should a way out of war be sought? The article gives the following answer. The way out is the path of bringing pressure to bear on the provisional government with a demand that the government proclaim its readiness to begin immediate negotiations for peace. We could adduce many similar quotations, covertly defensist and conciliationist in character. During this same period, and even weeks earlier, Lenin, who had not yet freed himself from his Zurich cage, was thundering in his letters from afar most of these letters, never reached Pravda against the faintest hint of any concessions to defensism and conciliationism. It is absolutely impermissible, he wrote on March 9, discerning the image of revolutionary events in the distorted mirror of capitalist dispatches. It is absolutely impermissible to conceal from ourselves and from the people that this government wants to continue the imperialist war, that it is an agent of British capital that it wants to restore the monarchy and strengthen the rule of the landlords and capitalists. And later, on March 12, he said, To urge that government to conclude a democratic peace is like preaching virtue to brothel keepers. At the time when Pravda was advocating exerting pressure on the provisional government in order to induce it to intervene in favor of peace before the eyes of world democracy, Lenin was writing, to urge the guchkov milyakov government to conclude a speedy, honest, democratic, and good neighborly peace is like the good village priest urging the landlords and the merchants to walk in the way of God, to love their neighbors, and to turn the other cheek CW, Moscow 1954, Vol. 23, Letters from Afar March 9 and 12, 1917, pp. 315-336. On April 4, the day after his arrival at Petrograd, 
Lenin came out decisively against the position of Pravda on the question of war and peace. He wrote, No support for the provisional government. The utter falsity of all its promises should be made clear, particularly of those relating to the renunciation of annexations. Exposure in place of the impermissible, illusion-breeding demand that this government, a government of capitalists, should cease to be an imperialist government. C.W. Vol. 24, The Tasks of the Proletariat in the Present Revolution, April 4, 1917, P. 22. It goes without saying that the proclamation issued by the conciliators on March 14, which had met with so many compliments from Pravda, was characterized by Lenin only as notorious and muddled. It is the height of hypocrisy to summon other nations to break with their bankers, while simultaneously forming a coalition government with the bankers of one's own country. In the center, all vow and declare that they are Marxists and internationalists, that they are for peace, for bringing every kind of pressure to bear upon the governments, for demanding in every way that their own government should ascertain the will of the people for peace. C.W. Vol. 24, Tasks of the Proletariat in Our Revolution, a draft platform for the Proletarian Party, May 28, 1917, p. 76. But here someone may at first glance raise an objection. Ought a revolutionary party to refuse to exercise pressure on the bourgeoisie and its government? Certainly not. The exercise of pressure on a bourgeois government is the road of reform. A revolutionary Marxist party does not reject reforms. But the road of reform serves a useful purpose in subsidiary and not in fundamental questions. State power cannot be obtained by reforms. Pressure can never induce the bourgeoisie to change its policy on a question that involves its whole fate. The war created a revolutionary situation precisely by reason of the fact that it left no room for any reformist pressure. The only alternative was either to go the whole way with the bourgeoisie or to rouse the masses against it so as to wrest the power from its hands. In the first case, it might have been possible to secure from the bourgeoisie some kind of sop with regard to home policy, on the condition of unqualified support of their foreign imperialist policy. For this very reason, social reformism transformed itself openly, at the outset of the war, into social imperialism. For the same reason, the genuinely revolutionary elements were forced to initiate the creation of this new international. The point of view of Pravda was not proletarian and revolutionary, but democratic defensist, even though vacillating in its defensism. We had overthrown Surism. We should now exercise pressure on our own democratic government. The latter must propose peace to the peoples of the world. If the German democracy proves incapable of exerting due pressure on its own government, then we shall defend our fatherland to the last drop of blood. The prospect of peace is not posed as an independent task of the working class, which the workers are called upon to achieve over the head of the provisional government, because the conquest of power by the proletariat is not posed as a practical revolutionary task. Yet these two tasks are inextricably bound together. 